Good morning. This is Commandments of the New Testament, and uh, this is episode 104, 104. And uh, this is the second half of the commandments uh, regarding fasting, uh, the New Testament commandments on fasting. Now, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about fasting, and uh, we jumped into that last week. I've reorganized this a little bit uh uh, this uh, chart a little bit uh, for the sake of clarity. And uh, so uh, we'll be covering those parts of this chart that we didn't talk about last time. Last time we talked about uh, Jesus's commandments to fast, and uh, uh, I'm not going to repeat those, but uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three uh, gospels, uh, talk about the same passage uh, where Jesus says uh, that uh, after his ascension, uh, the church is to fast. While he is there with, uh, with the disciples, uh, they are not to fast. But uh, uh, after he leaves, uh, after he ascends into heaven, um, then uh, they will, they shall fast. And uh, that's... Uh, uh, that's Jesus' commandment. Now, uh, grab your Bibles and let's turn to uh, Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 16. This is a uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Jesus is giving a wide variety of different uh, uh, commands and uh, suggestions uh, to uh, to the people seated there, um, along with his disciples who were also seated there. Uh, chapter six is noteworthy because it talks about three, uh, actually four, different things that are to be done, all kind of with the same cautions, the same warnings, uh, the same uh, commandments, if you will. Um, those four things are uh, uh, giving of alms, um, prayer, uh, fasting, and uh, um, I can't remember the, the fourth thing, but uh, we'll get to it. Anyway, oh, uh, uh, giving, that is giving uh, uh, alms, deeds, uh, giving of uh, good deeds. Uh, so that's the fourth thing. All of them have the same structure. Uh, Jesus tells us to do all of those things in secret, and uh, that includes fasting. And here in, uh, uh, and we touched on this last time we got together, in verse, uh, verse 16 is where we'll pick it up. <clears throat> Jesus says, moreover, when you fast, notice that the assumption is that you will be fasting. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, I pointed out last time, I think, that uh, they have their reward is, an, is implying that uh, they uh, have already earned whatever reward God has in store for those who fast. Uh, it goes a little further in verse 17 and says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which is in which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Uh, the implication here or the, the statement, a uh, uh, clear statement, is that uh, God will reward fasting, if it's done according to the rules. Uh, this rule, in, in this case, uh, specifically, is that it must be done in secret. No one else should know that you're fasting. I think Rachel asked last time if, about uh, uh, the possibility of, of the rest of your family, your immediate family, knowing. And um, uh, I suspect that, like a lot of other things, uh, your immediate family uh, probably needs to know that you're fasting. And uh, um, this fasting, uh, I think I said this last time, but just, just for the sake of the tape, 
Uh, I think it's important to understand that this fasting is not done for health reasons or any other reason other than the purposes for which God has intended it. And we'll get to that. Now, we're going to touch on that at the end uh, today the, in summary, um, the purposes or the, uh, the intent of uh, uh, fasting. But the reward is the result, and uh, we're promised a reward. It goes a little further, though, if, if you don't stop at uh, um, verse 18. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 19. Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves will break through and steal. Notice that, that uh, uh, Jesus doesn't provide any transition between fasting and this statement. Both fasting and this statement should be familiar to us, but they are all part of the same statement. Uh, so when God is talking about rewards, uh, the next question that most people would have is, are these rewards going to be here on earth or are they going to be in heaven? What rewards is God talking about? Uh, I think that because he continues, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where... <laughs> Thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable that this tells us that the rewards that are being spoken of regarding fasting are heavenly rewards, and that we will receive those at the first resurrection. Uh, we're, we're given that, uh, uh, that implication uh, about the first resurrection later on in, uh, in a different passage. But the point is that these treasures uh, that uh, we will receive are probably not treasures, not rewards that we will have here in this life. They'll be in the next life, treasures in heaven. Okay, let's continue. Now, last time we talked about... Uh, uh, serving God and elevating prayer, elevating prayer uh, were purposes that were given to us for fasting in the New Testament. Uh, elevating prayer is probably not the best way of saying that. If I had to rewrite that and uh, redo this chart, I would probably say uh, 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 praying in humbleness. Uh, that is uh, uh, fasting as we will see, is intended to humble us before God, and God is pleased by that. Um, I, I know that sounds funny on the face of it, but think of how many times you hear people praying um, without humbleness when they pray to God, uh, especially when they're in a group of people and they're praying out loud in front of a group of people. Uh, they tend to play, pray, not not necessarily frivolously or flippantly, but but they do pray um, uh, kind of with a, uh, an intent to communicate to God what they need. And, and uh, um, so they're, they're kind of telling God things that God, frankly, already knows about, doesn't he? Uh, the prayers that we are to give God are supposed to be prayed in humility and in humbleness and meekness. And uh, uh, that is intensified when we combine prayer with fasting. Uh, so serving God is also given to us as one of the purposes for fasting. And we talked about these two things last time, serving God and uh, humbling our prayers to him. Uh, the, the next one is sorrow and uh, mourning or sorrow is something that uh, I should touch on simply because God does. Uh, when we are sorrowing or mourning, uh, uh, it is an appropriate time for us to fast. God says so. Uh, the reason that God says so, I believe, is that like many other things, um, uh, our sorrow and our mourning are, lose a little bit of their sting when we are fasting before God, when we're focused on God in humility. This is a, this is a hard thing for us to imagine, but uh, uh, there's an old saying that... Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorrow uh, shared is half sorrow, and joy shared is twice joy. Uh, the uh, 
the implication is that that uh, there is a magical thing that happens with sorrow and joy, for that matter, when it's shared. In this case, fasting allows us to share these things with God in a way that prayer all by itself simply does not. And so uh, fasting is kind of an important thing, even though quite often it is linked to prayer. Let's, uh, let's go back to Judges chapter 20, way back in the Old Testament. Judges chapter 20, verse 26. Everybody there? <clears throat> 26 says, Then all the children of Israel and all of the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, a couple things spring out of this. Not, first of all, the, the intent of this particular fasting uh, and, and this visit to God's house was not rejoicing, it was sorrow. A sorrow uh, over uh, a variety of different things, not the least of which was their sin. The, the point is that uh, they were fasting in sorrow. But another thing that, that kind of rears its head right here that we're gonna touch on uh, with a little bit more uh, force in a little bit is that the the mention of the length of the fast is a day. Uh, uh, the, the day, because it happens so often, the day of fasting or the days of fasting, uh, lend some credential to the idea that fasting should be done in whole days, in uh, uh, day and night, whole 24-hour periods. Um, I'll leave it to you to decide when your fast should start. Uh, the Jews, of course, decided that their fast should start at dusk and uh, uh, probably after the meal, uh, knowing that they're going to fast, they'll, they'll snack or, or have their dinner early and then at dusk they start their fast. Um, I've wondered about that. Uh, fasting, to start your fast, I would think that uh, you, would, you would naturally think that a fast uh, is harder on you later on than it is at the beginning. But I, I suspect that you'll find that it's the other way around, that in fact, it's the first half of the fast that's the hardest. And uh, then it becomes easier and easier to uh, continue your fast. Uh, but that may vary person to person, so don't, don't hold me to account for this. Um, the point is that, that uh, fasting is never given to us in Scripture for an hour. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast this meal. Uh, the other thing that you're going to see happen here, and I'll, I'll point it out as we, as we walk through this, is that fasting is not done for, from uh, frivolous, silly things like uh, I, I'm going to fast for for 20, the next 24 hours, and, and uh, I'm going to fast from chocolate, you know, I, uh, <laughs> or, or uh, cookies. I'm not going to have any cookies for the next uh, three hours. So that's going to be my fast before the Lord. Um, don't, don't take this uh, frivolously. This is supposed to be serious stuff. And that's why we're touching on this, this whole concept of sorrow as a purpose for fasting, as well as uh, as well as mourning and and uh, uh, serving God and humbleness in prayer, uh, these are serious issues. The, this is not a silly kind of a thing, and and unfortunately, I've seen it made fun of in in the church. In fact, a lot of people don't fast because they're convinced that it is simply. Um, uh, self-harm. You're hurting yourself, uh, trying to get God's attention. Uh, 
There are other people who say, well, by fasting, we increase our spiritual discernment, our spiritual awareness. No, no, that never happens in Scripture. Uh, that's not a, a purpose uh, for, for uh, fasting. We'll get to the purposes, and, and frankly, this, these are the three purposes here in summary form. Serving God. God sees this as a service we perform to him. So if you want to serve God, one of the ways that you can serve God is to worship him. Another way that you can serve him is to fast. And he takes pleasure in your fast. I know that sounds funny, but he takes pleasure in your fast. And he's promised to reward it. Think about that. So there's a reason for us to fast. And the purposes are these three. Sorrow before God. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7. Verse 5. <clears throat> 5 and 6. Here the Jews again are repenting of uh, their corporate sin, their national sin. Uh, verse 5 says, And Samuel said, uh, Gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Once again, it's a day that they chose, uh, not part of a day, not a day and a half. It was whole days, in this case, one day that they fasted before the Lord because of the sin of the, of the uh, children of Israel. Um, let's continue to uh, 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 the end of 1 Samuel, chapter 31, verse 12. This is the, the end. This is how 1 Samuel closes. Remember that uh, Samuel was one of the longest books in the Bible, uh, along with Kings. Um, uh, the Kings uh, and uh, uh, the Chronicles were also very long books, scrolls uh, that they managed to, the Jews did, a long time ago. And they became very cumbersome to use. Uh, they were always tearing because they were so large and so bulky to manage to. So they decided rather than allow them to be torn all the time, that they would actually cut it in two and make two scrolls out of each one of these. That's where First and Second Samuel come from. Uh, they're all the same scroll, but it was cut in half and divided into two scrolls and called First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles the same way leaving Isaiah now as the largest uh, of, the, of the books, uh, discounting Psalms for a minute. Um, but uh, Psalms is the song book, and, and uh, uh, these are a little bit more uh, focused for the Jews. So the, the largest remaining book uh, of uh, uh, historical kinds of issues uh, is, is Isaiah now. First uh, Samuel ends with uh, uh, verses 12 and 13. All the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall at Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted for seven days. Uh, once again, uh, the purpose of their fast was mourning. Uh, they were not trying to get God to bring them back. They were simply mourning over the, the dead, Saul and his sons. On, on the ark? Uh, well, yeah, different, different reasons, different stories, and fasting, I don't think, was involved there. So... Seven days is a big deal for a lot of different reasons. Uh, that's where the honeymoon is, and uh, that's not the same thing as morning, hopefully. <laughs> now, 
So uh, uh, yeah, seven days is uh, it comes up quite often, particularly uh, when the subject is mourning or or joy for that matter. Um, uh, the uh, 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 feast of unleavened bread uh, at Passover lasts for seven days, and uh, at the end of the year, the uh, uh, Sukkot lasts for seven days. And so there are a lot of of different uses for the number seven. The Jews consider the number seven as the number of completeness, and so it's uh, it's a uh, a day uh, count. Uh, that's the way God originally set it up, and this day count was uh, Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth, seven days in the week, and and uh, the like. Uh, here, though, at the end of First Samuel, we see um, this seven-day fast. The the fast lasted for seven days. Um, I should, uh, and I think I mentioned last time that that uh, uh, the experts tell us that you can go for 40 days without food before your body begins to shut down in death, and uh, uh, but you can go only seven days without water, and so uh, there are uh, a lot of things that we can discern from this. Seven days probably was a fast from food, but it could have also been from water. People in Scripture, in in the Bible, don't fast from liquids alone. They they never fast uh, for uh, from water, for instance, or from wine or or things like that. Those things are not considered a fast. Uh, a fast assumes food. And when we fast in Scripture, we see all food included. In other words, we don't. We don't just fast from beef or potatoes or something like that. It's a fast from all food in whole days. Um, Every once in a while, it will say that so-and-so fasted from food and water. And in that case, the water is included in the fast. But if it doesn't say that, the assumption over and over again in Scripture is that the fast is from food and food alone, but all food, no no food intake at all, uh, but water uh, would be would be considered uh, fine during a fast, unless it specifically says and water. To continue, let's go to Second Samuel uh, chapter one, just right there on the next page, kind of a thing, and uh, in first. Uh, 2 Samuel, uh, verse 1, uh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, it says, Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them. He ripped his clothes, and likewise all the men that were with him. Now, when it says ripped their clothes, um, we're, we're not exactly sure, but the original Hebrew tends to uh, tends to imply, at least, that what they did is they ripped their clothes along seams. This was a common uh, method of mourning and expressing grief and sorrow. Um, when you were really upset about something, you'd rip your clothes. Uh, quite often, you'd just reach up to, to your collar and rip it, and it would automatically rip by the seams. Um, if it does rip by the seams, you could sew it back together again. You'll see in in often in movies uh, that are historically uh, uh, semi accurate anyway. You'll often see uh, clothing, um, shirts, and and even pants that has uh, very wide stitching in it. That is the it's not a tight seam. Uh, it's a kind of an open seam with a zigzag stitch holding it together. Um, we we have reason to believe that this this is a very ancient way of putting uh, external clothing together in particular, and uh, that that facilitated the ripping at the seams. That was the first thing to rip. The cloth itself didn't rip as easily as the seams did. So you might think of it that way. Uh, David here in uh, verse eleven ripped his clothes. And likewise, all the men that were with him, everybody there, uh, ripped their clothes. And they mourned, and they wept, and they fasted until even for Saul, uh, for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. 
um, until even uh, is the beginning of the next day, until even. And so there's some reason to believe that that this is not a partial day. In other words, they didn't stop at even. They stopped at the end of the day. Um, we'll remember that uh, the Jewish day begins at dusk. And at this time in history, uh, including the first century church, uh, it was until probably until the Middle Ages, um, all countries all over the world began their, their days at dusk. This wasn't just a Jewish thing. This was universal. Um, so uh, uh, the things that changed this was secularism and, and uh, um, uh, a lot of politics and, um, and atheism uh, went into the idea that we should change that and now make it midnight. And the truth is that uh, uh, even though our days change at midnight, we at one o'clock in the morning, we still think of that as the, the night following the earlier day. So tonight at midnight, even though technically speaking, we say it's the next day, it's Monday from midnight on, um, at one o'clock in the morning, we would still think of this as Sunday night. It's still Sunday night. Okay, uh, that's uh, 11 and 12. Let's uh, continue in 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, rather, chapter 12, 2 Samuel Verse 15 to 23, uh, this once again is speaking of David, uh, and this gives us kind of an interesting picture. David, uh, as you know, uh, committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba, uh, and there was a, a child born of this union, and the child became sick very early on, very quickly, and, uh, and died. And this is the account uh, of uh, David's reaction, not only to the sickness, but ultimately to the death of the child. Verse 13, 2 Samuel 12. And David said unto, unto Nathan, Nathan uh, being the prophet, uh, I have sinned against the Lord. And said unto David, and uh, Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, uh, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that was Uriah's wife's, uh, that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Now, he began his fast probably at dusk, he laid down all night long on the floor. This was the beginning of, of the next day. And the elders of his house arose and went to him uh, to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass that on the seventh day, the child died. Uh, David fasted for seven days and uh, lay on the floor like this, uh, uh, for seven days. He was, the assumption was that he was praying during this time for God to deliver the child. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't fasting in mourning uh, yet because the child was sick and he was hoping that God would uh, change his mind. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead for they said, behold, <laughs> While the child was yet alive, we spake to him, and he would not hear our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? They were afraid to tell David. I mean, if David had been fasting for seven days, laying on the floor, uh, fasting for seven days now, what would he do when he found out that the child died? But when David saw that his, nervous, his, his servants were whispering, uh, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And David arose from the earth and washed himself and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Notice that the first thing he did when he got up off the floor was not eat. Uh, when he required, then he was ready to eat. Uh, the assumption is that he finished his seven-day fast at dusk. 
Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? <laughs> what, what's going on here? Uh, uh, thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was yet alive. But when the child was dead, you did rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious unto me? In other words, change his mind. That the child may live, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Uh, the um, uh, implication was that the purpose of David's fast in this case was not sorrow or mourning. It was uh, a humbling prayer. Uh, he was hoping that God would change his mind. And when the child died, uh, his fast was done. His, his attempt at changing the mind of God was done. Um, it was not intended as a, a fast of mourning. Let's... Uh, uh, step forward now. That that concludes the passages on fasting that were were intended for or about uh, sorrow and mourning. Um, the next section is how to fast. This is uh, uh, the Bible telling us that uh, there are things that we should know about fasting and how to fast. And this is important to us too, even though much of this uh, is. Uh, uh, Old Testament stuff that still gives us a sense of what fasting meant to the Jews, what they understood about fasting that uh, we as Gentiles may not understand. And that's why the Old Testament is here, um, so that we can learn what God meant, what the Jews understood uh, from God about these different things. Uh, first of all, secretly, God has uh, made it clear that we are to to uh, uh, fast in secret, and we've already touched on that. But uh, when it comes to how to fast, uh, we we should consider this as a humbling experience. Fasting is a humbling experience before God. Afflicting the soul is the key here, um, uh, and uh, they go so far in some cases as to wear sackcloth. Now, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, I'll touch on that uh, uh, when we do get there. Let's turn back to Leviticus. Back to Leviticus. Chapter 16. Chapter 16, verses 29 to 31. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Notice the phrase, you shall afflict your souls. Uh, the, the phrase, uh, the Jewish phrase, afflict your souls, is synonymous with fasting, with, hung, with the hunger that it produces. Um, so you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether uh, it be one of your own country or str a stranger that sojourneth among you. Uh, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all of your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Uh, this, of course, is speaking of Yom Kippur the establishment of uh, the great fast. Uh, you'll hear people, uh, including me, I've made this mistake too, talk about the, the feasts of the Lord and that there were seven great feasts given in the Torah um, uh, for uh, uh, the uh, people of Israel to follow. They, uh, there weren't seven feasts. There were, were six feasts and a fast. Uh, Yom Kippur was not a feast. It was quite the opposite. Where they were not allowed to eat at all on that day. Uh, once again, it was the whole day, and once again, it was all food. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is also uh, uh, reiterated in chapter 23, verse 26. 
Let's turn to chapter 23 of Leviticus. Chapter 23, verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement, and it shall be an holy convocation unto you. Now, a holy convocation is... Uh, is also kind of a code phrase in in uh, the Old Testament. Um, God uh, used this phrase, this holy convocation, to express the idea that there was a distinction in Sabbath days. Uh, you think of Sabbath as every Saturday, and it is. That's a Sabbath day. But there were also high Sabbaths. That's what they called them in the New Testament, high Sabbaths. Uh, a, a day that was an ultra Sabbath. Uh, a day that did not occur on Saturday, but it was nevertheless to be considered not just a Sabbath, but a, a great Sabbath, a high Sabbath. So it shall be an holy convocation unto you that you shall afflict your souls, uh, that is fast, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it may be, uh, uh, it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And that soul that doeth any work in that same day, the same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings. Notice the, the repetition here of the idea, not only that this is a fast, and it's a day of holy convocation, no work is to be done in this, in this Sabbath, but that this is going to be a statute forever. Now, a lot of people in the Christian church today believe that the Old Testament, that is the Mosaic law, uh, the Old Testament law, uh, was replaced uh, by grace, God's grace in the New Testament. Uh, everything changed, and uh, the law is no more. Uh, the truth is that uh, they must understand, they must believe that God changed things uh, with the New Testament. That is, he came up with a new covenant or a new testament, if you will, and um, uh, so everything was changed. And the reason that he changed things was because the old way wasn't working. But this, of course, assumes that God was surprised by, by how things didn't work out under the old system. We know that God wasn't surprised. In fact, he knew all of this was going to happen before the foundations of the, uh, of the world were laid. Um, he knew that, uh, God, uh, that uh, the sins of man would uh, be perverse and that he would need to do the flood he would need to do the cross, and he would need to do all of the church as well. So this came as nothing of a surprise to God. Uh, indeed, this was part of his plan all along. So when you hear people talk about the new covenant or uh, the new dispensation, uh, uh, what, you're, what you miss is the fact that God, way back in Leviticus, way back in the Old Testament, said these things are going to be forever. And it wasn't because he was clueless about what might change. It was with the full understanding of God that he intended for the New Testament, and he intended for the cross, and he intended and planned for man's sin. So this doesn't change things. If he says it's forever, it's forever. This is God saying this, not man. So these things are forever, these, these feasts and this fast. But it goes well beyond this. And uh, uh, I think we've talked about this before. The, the entire Mosaic law was intended to be forever. And uh, God said so. God said so. Let's, uh, let's continue here with uh, um, Numbers 29. Numbers 29.
Numbers 29, verse 7. And uh, we won't read the whole passage, just verse 7, uh, to get the flavor for it. But here again in Numbers, it says, And you shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month an holy convocation, uh, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall not do any work therein. Notice that this fast was not intended for us to decide when to fast. This fast was given by God. He ordered this fast. He commanded this fast to occur every year on this day. The Jews are going to fast on this day, and they would fast on this day forever. Uh, let's uh, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah, turn way over. Isaiah 58. Verse 3. Let's pick it up in verse 1, actually, to get uh, the, the context here. Um, God is speaking through Isaiah to the people and uh, uh, telling them that the way that they fast is wrong, that they're doing it wrong. Cry aloud. Verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sin. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delight in approaching God. Wherefore, have we fasted, they say, and you see not. In other words, they're saying, I'm fasting, Lord, and but you're not seeing it. Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure, and exact all of your labors. Uh, the uh, What they're doing in the days that they fast is taking pleasure in those days. They're not doing it humbly. They're not doing it according to the rules. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do these days to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Uh, the, uh, uh, we could continue, but the idea here, of course, is that, that uh, the people were fasting. Yes, they were going without food, but they weren't following the rules. They weren't fasting according to God's instructions. They weren't doing it in humility. They were doing it in pride. They were, they were proud of what they were doing. They weren't humbling themselves before God. They were, in fact, they were, they were using this as an opportunity to argue with other people about what they were doing and how they were doing it. And they were involved horizontally with their, their attempts. The, the, um, uh, they, they weren't doing it according to God's plan, God's intent. Uh, so uh, we need to be careful about that too. Uh, verses 10 and 11 spring to mind too. Uh, skip forward to verse 10. Um, this is 58, verse 10. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as noonday. Uh, God is saying uh, this affliction of soul, uh, that, that phrase again, is being used now for not of the fast that, that is the context of this passage, but for the people who are poor and needy and are hungry as a result. 
um, you should be feeding them rather than yourselves. And so uh, make your fast, humble yourselves before the Lord. And one of the ways that you can please God is to take perhaps the food that you're not eating and give it instead to the poor. Uh, the poor who are afflicted of soul because they are hungry, just like you are, but they have no solution. At the end of your fast, you're going to eat. That's not the case for them. Let's, uh, let's talk about sackcloth here real quick. Uh, 1 Kings, uh, you can skip back to 1 Kings. First Kings chapter 21. Ahab was a wicked king before God. And this is uh, uh, the Ahab that is being talked about here. Um, and it came to pass that when Ahab heard those words that he ripped his clothes and put on sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. Um, Ahab repented before the Lord, and he fasted and wore sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth is, uh, uh, think of a burlap bag. Um, if you had underwear on made of burlap, uh, you'd kind of get the idea of wearing sackcloth against your skin. That's what it's talking about. Um, they didn't wear it as an overcoat with underclothes underneath it to protect their body from the, the burlap, they wore it against their skin. So think of underclothes, a t-shirt or an undershirt and uh, um, uh, underpants that uh, were made of burlap against their skin. Um, this is uh, a common kind of a thing among the children of Israel when they fasted to show God that they were uh, not, not that they were intent on harming themselves or discomforting themselves, but they were doing this specifically because they wanted to serve God. They wanted to focus on God, and even if it meant that they themselves were hurt or, or suffered as a result. Um, this is kind of what we've been talking about in the commandments. Uh, God's plan uh, supersedes our own. God isn't there to help us with our plans and purposes. We're supposed to be here to help God with his. To the extent that even if it harms me temporarily, uh, I should be happy and rejoicing in God's plans and purposes. Uh, unfortunately, the church today sees God as a benefactor, and that is his job. Uh, he gives us good things, and all good comes from heaven. Um, all bad comes from hell, and uh, so forth. Um, that's not what Scripture teaches us, and it's not that way when it comes to fasting either. Let's skip forward to Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Uh, we're skipping forward here through uh, Kings and Chronicles, and after Chronicles is Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1, now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths, and the earth was upon them. Um, the, uh, uh, well, let's continue. And, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God, one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God, and of course all of the day they were fasting. the uh, uh, The point, though, that's being made here is that these people were were 
these thing these people were learning the law of God for the first time, and uh, uh, they had no idea that some of the things that they had been doing that they thought were fine were actually sins against God. Uh, that's the same way that the church, the same position the church is in today. A lot of the things that that we are doing in the church today, God has already spoken against. He's already told us this is a sin. This is a dis uh, a disobedience to him, uh, and in some cases, even an abomination. We say uh, things glibly in the church today, like God answers every prayer, and sometimes the answer is no. That's not true. That's not true. God doesn't answer every prayer because he doesn't. He refuses to even hear prayers that aren't following the rules that he's given us about prayer. Uh, let's turn over a couple more pages to Esther, chapter 4. Esther, chapter 4. Uh, wearing this sackcloth then, and you'll notice that ashes were included. In, in dirt, in this case, uh, uh, dust was upon them. Uh, the idea is that, that you, uh, a lot of people back in that time would afflict their souls by fasting and wearing sackcloth against their skin. And just to make sure that they uh, they were seeing this correctly, they would throw ashes or just dust up into the air and let it sprinkle down all over them. Um, it made people very uncomfortable to be covered with ashes and dust and sackcloth and fasting. And, and in this way, uh, they could please God, not because they were in pain, but because they were focused on doing what God had asked them to do in God's way. And they didn't let their own pride and selfish motivations get in the way and dis distract them from this focused humbleness before God. Uh, pride had no place if they were covered in sackcloth and ashes and in fasting. Chapter 4 of Esther, verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai ripped his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came that came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the kingdom's king's gate clothed with sackcloth. You couldn't, they, the guards wouldn't allow you past the king's gate if you were wearing sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and this, his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Sometimes you didn't even need to wear it. Sometimes you'd make your bed out of burlap. And so you'd lay sackcloth on the ground and you would lay on the sackcloth and weep and mourn and, uh, and continue your fast. So Esther's maid, maids and her chamberlains came and told her, told it to her, and then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. He wouldn't take it because he was bitter, bitterly uh, uh, mourning uh, before the Lord. Uh, to continue this uh, this affliction of the soul and this sackcloth, uh, uh, let's skip forward to Psalm 35. Psalm 35. Verse 13. It's a psalm of David, and David is talking to God. Uh, he's he is telling uh, God and those who hear the song that uh, uh, even though his enemies were out to hurt him, uh, he did nothing but good to his enemies. But as for me, verse thirteen, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned unto my own bosom. The uh, uh, idea is that he would pray for them, he would wear sackcloth, and he would, he would fast for them if they were sick. Uh, he would go to these extremes for his enemies, even though they were 
intent on his harm. Psalm 69 is next. Psalm 69. Verses 10 and 11. The same kind of thing is being spoken of here. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb unto them. Um, he wore sackcloth along with his fasting to make sure that his focus was proper in this fasting and that he wasn't doing it wrong. Uh, he wanted to remain focused on God and his hum and hum humbleness before God. I'm going to skip Isaiah 53, uh, 58, 3 to 7, because we've already touched on that. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Everybody there? Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made confession. And I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. Think about that, the great and dreadful God. Uh, that's... You you wouldn't say things in the church like that today, would you? You, uh, if you called God the dreadful God, uh, people would be offended in the church. And yet Daniel is the one who is saying this, and it is in sackcloth and ashes and fasting that he's saying it as he prays to God. O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned, and we have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Uh, and, and it goes on from there. The, the point is that uh, 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 he, was, he was really trying to get in the right attitude of prayer here. He, he wanted to cover all of the bases because he was really mourning. He was sorrowful, sorrowful for what they were doing, and he wanted to make sure that, that uh, uh, their repentance was real. Turn to Jonah. Jonah's a little book. Uh, it's real easy to skip right past it. Um, uh, it's on the other side of Obadiah, which is an even smaller book. Uh, but Jonah, chapter 3. We all know the story about Jonah, uh, but uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 5 to 10, it tells us that after Jonah walked into the city of Nineveh and said, uh, 40 days and you're all going to die, God's going to blast you. Uh, that it picks up here. Um, in fact, verse four, let's read that for the context. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So verse five, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and of his nobles, saying, neither, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God 
Yea, let them turn every one from his evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented. Now, the repented here is the same repentance that you and I are called to. It's changing of your mind, changing the course that you had followed. When we repent of our sins, it doesn't mean that we're sorry. It means that we intend to change and not do this again. We're changing our minds on this thing. And the same thing applies to God when he repents. He repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. So God did change his mind here as a result of their prayers because they had added sackcloth and ashes and fasting to those prayers. Everybody in the whole kingdom, and Nineveh was huge. Nineveh was huge. Now that's, uh, that's afflicting the soul. Uh, afflicting the soul being, again, a, a catchphrase, a, a phrase that the Jews uh, uh, see, saw as, the, as synonymous with uh, fasting, deep fasting, intent on, excuse me, intent on uh, sorrow before God and uh, enhancing or elevating their prayer and service before God as well. Now, there's, there's an awful lot to be said. Uh, and the reason that we're going through this the way that we are is because this is an exercise in knowing what the entire Bible has to say about fasting. Um, I, I know that some of this stuff doesn't mean anything to you, uh, but it's not necessary. What is necessary is that you know everything that God has said about fasting. Because we are called to fast in the New Testament. The church is supposed to be fasting. And we don't fast. I was never taught to fast, let alone how to fast or why to fast. Uh, so I'm taking everything that the Bible has to say about it so that you've been exposed to these things and that you can understand the answers to these questions where I wasn't taught growing up. This is God telling us about fasting, not Steve, not me, not me. We've covered a lot of the verses in yellow there, and uh, so let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, as a reminder... Speaking of Jesus here, it says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, a lot of people make light of that. Um, they, they say, well, yeah, I guess so. He, was, he must have been hungry after, after uh, 40 days and 40 nights. Um, the word hungered there is actually translated from a Greek word that means much, much more than simply hungry. Um, it means famished starving at the point of death. And so Jesus had, uh, had fasted un unto the endurance of his human body. Um, it, it was uh, at that point that the tempter came and said, uh, turn that rock into, into bread. And uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, get a, you know, uh, forget that. You know, I'm not taking suggestions from Satan. <laughs> And, and the temptation of Christ immediately follows this 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Notice that it was night and day, that it was, again, whole days, uh, this fast was, 40 of them in this case, night and day. It wants to make that clear. Now turn to uh, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Verses 14 to 21. Now, we covered this last time, and so I, I, by way of review, I thought that it would be appropriate for us to touch on this again in the context of uh, 
is something new that we can take away from this that we didn't touch on last time. And when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him, that is unto Jesus, a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, that is, privately. They waited until the crowd had dispersed, and they found a moment to be with Jesus alone, privately. And they said, Why could not we cast this demon out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you heard this one before, you you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to a yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? And that's an important word. Notice that Jesus said, Nothing shall be impossible to you. However, that's kind of an interesting thing that follows never. However, this kind goeth out not ex except by prayer and fasting. Now, what this tells us is something very important. Faith here and the amount of it that you have, no matter how much faith you have, prayer and fasting is required. In addition to your faith to cast out this demon, this tells us that faith is not a complete package that faith alone is insufficient in at least some cases to accomplish what it is that you wish to accomplish. I said last time, and I'll reiterate that here, um, whenever you hear the word faith, you should say in, in your mind, if not out loud, faith in what? Faith in what? Because too many people read this and they misunderstand what's being said. They think it means faith that I can move this mountain. I can't move a mountain. It doesn't matter how much faith I have, I cannot move this mountain. It is faith in God to move this mountain that this is calling me to. And unfortunately, we don't catch that. So say in your mind, whenever you hear the word faith, say in your mind, faith in what? because it'll lead you in the right direction. If we have faith in God, all we have to do is have faith in God and really believe that he wants to and he is capable, he is willing and able to cast this mountain into the sea. Then nothing can be impossible for us because nothing is impossible to God. Now, the truth is, nobody has ever been able to cast a mountain into the sea except God. In fact, the only way that we've been able to move mountains by our faith is figuratively, which leads a lot of people to think that this is what is being implied here. Figuratively, you can move mountains with faith. But again, you have to ask faith in what? And the answer is faith in God. God can move mountains physically as well as figuratively. God can do anything. Nothing is impossible to him. So when you pray, pray believing. Remember, that's one of the commandments. We have to believe that God is both willing and able to do whatever it is that he does. And we pray of God believing there are way too many prayers that are spoken to God that we really don't think he's going to answer. That's unbelief in prayer. And no, he won't answer that prayer. So we pray believing that God is, is able to answer this prayer. And we are asking him to be willing to do that. 
in this case, Jesus didn't have to do this because he was God himself. And so he nevertheless asked God. Elsewhere, Jesus said, I do nothing except that which the Father has given me. The important thing here is that faith in God is what's being discussed, even though the wording can be confusing. We have to remember that it's not faith in ourselves or faith in luck or faith in some other thing. It's faith in God that's important. Uh, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Verse 11 and 12. We also talk, touched on this last time, but I'll read it again because uh, there's something else in this same passage to take away. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all I possess. Uh, he fasted twice a week. Now, that means on two different days. He fasted all day long, two days per week, not consecutively, but twice a week. The, the takeaway here is that twice a week is something he's proud of. It's beyond the expectations of fasting. So if you decide how often to fast, know that two days per week is probably over the top. In this case, it engenders pride in this Pharisee that he does this. Uh, let's continue in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 30. Acts 10, verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. That is uh, this hour that we're in right now. Until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Obviously an angel. The idea here is that at the ninth hour, he was interrupted from his fast. After four days, keep in mind that the ninth hour depends on what season it is, as well as what latitude you're at. Now, fortunately, we are about at the same latitude in the world as Cornelius was when this happened. So we can relate. And by relate, I mean, depending on what season of the year it is, the sun comes up in a different place. It travels a different path in summer versus winter. And, and our days are shorter. The Jews didn't have clocks. They didn't measure time by what time it was on the clock. Uh, when it says the ninth hour, it's the ninth hour from sunup. And so if it's late in coming up, as it would be in the, in the winter time, uh, the ninth hour could be closer to five o'clock than it would be to three o'clock in the summer. Uh, so there's a big difference there. And uh, so this ninth hour could be anywhere between, say, three o'clock in the afternoon and five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, either way, it's approaching dusk. And that's, that's the implication here. It was approaching dusk, and I had been fasting for four full days and suddenly an angel appeared to me. The, uh, uh, the next uh, passages, uh, we've, we've already talked about uh, a lot of these things, but, but I'll, I'll just touch on these things uh, because uh, we've already read through them, looked them up in our, in our Bibles. Um, Judges 20, 26, And the children of Israel and all of the people went up and came to the house of God and wept, and sat there before the Lord and fasted 
that day until even, that is until dusk. And so they, they fasted all day. They fasted full days, whole days. First uh, Samuel 7, 5 to 6, the same kind of a thing. And Samuel said, gather together all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. It's interesting that they did that. Um, and fasted on that day and said, there, uh, and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. 1 Samuel 31, 12 to 13, And the valiant men arose and went all night and took the bodies of Saul and his sons uh, from the wall at Beth Shen and came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Uh, the implication is not part of the days, uh, just in the, in the daylight, but rather uh, seven full days. 2 Samuel 1, 11 to 12, And David took hold on his clothes and ripped them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even, that is dusk, at the end of the, the day and the beginning of the next day, uh, for Saul and Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen, uh, they were fallen by the sword. Um, 2 Samuel 12, 15 to 23 is the longer passage having to do with uh, uh, Bathsheba's son uh, by David. And uh, uh, the, the important takeaway here is that David pa uh, fasted for, again, for full days. And in this case, uh, seven full days, not partial days. And he fasted from food. Um, given all of these things, and, and we'll conclude uh, the passages here, um, we've touched on almost every passage, if not every passage that has to do with fasting and or even sackcloth and fasting uh, in, in the entire Bible. And so what we can do is take away from these passages certain rules, if you will, or, or observations about fasting. The first thing that we can determine about fasting is that fasting is abstinence from all food. And sometimes from water, and, and or liquids as well, but all foods. So you can't just fast from milk. Uh, you, if, you're, if it's a fast, it's gonna be from all food. Fasting is implied as measured in whole days and nights, or rather nights and days, because that's how they did it in Bible times, both Old Testament and New Testament. Fasting is always physical and never spiritual or figurative. You'd be surprised at how many Christians decide to do things like fasting in their heads. In their heads. I'm going to fast figuratively. I'm going to fast spiritually for the next uh, day or so. I'm going to fast spiritually. No, fasting is a physical thing, not a figurative or a spiritual thing. Fasting is if afflicting the soul, that is humbling, literally humbling the life in me. Your soul is the life spark that, that science can't define, uh, a life, the life of me in me. Um, so afflicting my life is, uh, you know, we, we talk about exercising our, our body. Um, when we exercise our body, what we're really doing is exercising our muscles, right? That's what exercising means to us. If we are exercising anything in the, in the process of fasting, it would be exercising our life. We're stretching our lives out uh, in humbleness before God. I am humbling the life that is in me. Sometimes faith without fasting and prayer is not enough. Faith sometimes is not enough. It requires fasting and prayer as well. Fasting is pleasing to God and he promises to reward it. And for that reason alone, we should be fasting. We know from the experience of the Pharisee and his prayers that Fasting twice a week is probably over the top. It's not necessary to do it that often. But 
I'll leave it to you to decide. There's no rule in Scripture about how often you're supposed to fast. God doesn't set a timetable, so it's up to you. And remember that the reasons that we fast are specific. We are to fast in sorrow and mourning. We are to fast in prayer, in humble prayer, to make our prayers humble before God. And we are to uh, we are to be humble before the Lord, and that's what fasting helps us to do. Fasting is not done to enhance spiritual discernment. We don't, we don't become better people by fasting. That's not what it's for. In fact, the reasons that we fast are simply put to serve God and to humble me. I get humbled. God gets served. And that's the reason that we fast. None of that will happen in faith or prayer. Fasting is the way that we can both serve God and humble me. And that brings us to the conclusion of our uh, uh, study of fasting. Let's, uh, let's close in, in prayer here. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice in Jesus' name. Oh, my heart, rejoice. Forgive me, Lord, and my prayer, please hear. Let it be a sweet, welcomed sound in your ear. Amen.